The 66th International Motor Show, or IAA, has opened in Frankfurt. This year's motto is Mobility Connects. About 1,100 exhibitors from 39 countries are presenting their newest products, including 219 world premieres. The trend to cars with off-road capability continues unbroken. Just before the show opened, Jaguar presented what may be the show's most spectacular images. With the first SUV in its portfolio, the British car maker aims for a world record and had the new Jaguar F pace loop the loop. A powerful performance and a clear message, this car aims to turn the SUV world upside down. F pace is a crossover and therefore it is a combination out of people who want to have the agility, the sportiness, the drivability, but also the functionality and the possibility to go off-road. With the e-tron Quattro concept, Audi shows how it intends to develop its SUV family. The new machine is conceived as an all-electric car. Aerodynamic components on the front, sides and rear ensure optimal airflow around the vehicle. Audi chairman Rupert Stadler says the e-tron is a statement about the design language of the future. The car's new fuel cell technology will give it a range of more than 500 kilometers. The company plans to bring the e-tron to market in 2018. Seat 2 has been hard at work on the SUV theme. Its concept car, the Leon Cross Sport, combines three doors and off-road capability in a new way. Matthias Raba says the Cross Sport provides a glimpse of the Leon's potential. And Seat wants to see how people respond to this concept car. He considers it a fantastic car and wants to see it go into production. The Hyundai i20 Active also looks like an SUV. Markus Schreck, Hyundai's managing director in Germany, says it's two centimeters higher and has higher seats and metal cladding on the sides. It's a car for people who want to go off-road sometimes. It broadens the company's palette to target new customers. Lexus ties the SUV to environmental awareness. The hybrid RX450H is powered by a 3.5-liter V6 engine with direct fuel injection. Despite the system's 230 kilowatts, Lexus rates consumption at only 5.2 liters per 100 kilometers. Lexus general manager for Germany, Ferry Franz, says the car has been enlarged and given more legroom to meet customers' wishes. It has completely new navigation and safety technology. When it comes to hybrid technology, Toyota's Prius has been leading the pack for 18 years. At the IAA, the Japanese Prius's fourth generation has its world premiere. Fuel efficiency is 18% greater than its predecessors, and its whole body design is new. Toyota spokesman Dirk Breuer says the Prius has a new platform strategy, the Toyota New Global Architecture, or TNGA. Different models are built from the same range of parts. Another successor to a bestseller is VW's new generation of the Tiguan, based on the company's modular transverse matrix platform. VW has big plans for the Tiguan. The GTE offers a sneak peek of an electric version. A sporty R-Line model is ready to go into mass production. VW's head of powertrain development, Heinz Jakob Neusser, says the company will respond to market signals. And he can imagine a sporty derivative will do well, too. Volkswagen is also rolling out the Caddy Alltrack, an all-purpose vehicle available both as a sedan and a hatchback. Skoda's flagship, the Superb, has been given more space inside. Here at the IAA, the Czechs are showing their new station wagon version. Emile de Labbe, head of Skoda Germany, points out the completely new design language. The car is full of innovative technology, assistance systems, the latest infotainment, lots of room, and it comes with Skoda's persuasive price to performance. Opel's Astra, by contrast, has gotten smaller and more compact. 
And yet, inside, the completely newly developed generation gives passengers more space, and the Astra has shed about 200 kilograms. BMW's theme at the IAA is electrification, from the 2 Series through the 3 Series to the 7 Series, which is now being offered in a plug-in hybrid version, the 740 LE. It's rated at only 2.1 liters of fuel per 100 kilometers. Mini is celebrating the premiere of the Clubman, which isn't that many at all. BMW board member Peter Schwarzenbauer says the club man behind him is at the upper limit of what can still count as a Mini. At 4.25 meters, it's 43 centimeters longer than the three-door Mini. The club man has enough space for up to five people and 360 liters of cargo. And folding the back seat down increases the storage space to 1,250 liters. Along with the facelift of the 911 Carrera, the Mission E-Concept car is the eye-catcher at the Porsche stand. It provides a glimpse of the company's first all-electric vehicle. Porsche says the Mission E has a whopping 500-kilometer range. Porsche CEO Matthias Müller expects the company to decide by the end of the year to market a car like this within a decade. He says Porsche's goal is to offer a true electric drive sports car that is better than the competition in many areas. Mercedes, too, is peering into the future. Mercedes research executive Thomas Weber says this is the fastest the company has ever developed a show car. The key was digital processes. Computers also opened the way to such low air resistance figures. The intelligent aerodynamic automobile has set a record for CW value, or drag coefficient, at 0.19. The extension in the rear gives it a rocket tail look. Our car tester Sasha Knapp describes the newest addition to Porsche's Boxster series, a Spider. A Spider is traditionally the crowning achievement of a series, and the Boxster Spider is no exception. It conveys the essence of the Porsche brand, sportiness, and in this case, purism. The Spider is the lightest and at the same time most powerful vehicle in the Boxster range. The designers concentrated on optimizing its driving dynamics. The two-seater, mid-engine convertible has a manual six-speed transmission. Doing without luxuries saves weight, and the Spider's lightness is palpable every inch of the way. Sasha notes that the driver sits very low in the Spider. This lowers the center of gravity, providing additional stability. Unfortunately, when you look behind you, you see almost nothing, especially due to the design of the new trunk lid. The driver has to look past the two humps and really stretch his neck. The 3.8 liter engine comes from the Carrera S and generates 276 kilowatts of power. The Spider sprints from 0 to 100 in just 4.5 seconds. Porsche says the Boxster Spider's fuel consumption is 9.9 .9 liters per 100 kilometers. In the Sport Plus mode, the car automatically double declutches. When you shift gears, the engine briefly revs up, making the transition much smoother and providing a special sound experience. Sasha says the Porsche Boxster Spider's purism is lovely, but leads to an annoying inconvenience. The roof release motor has been removed, so you have to put the top down by hand. First, you must unlatch the soft top on both sides. Then, open the trunk. Then, push the top down into the trunk. And then, you have to close the trunk and turn down the latches separately on each side. Und hier noch zwei Laschen umlegen und fertig ist es. The Boxster Spider is a centimeter longer and 11 millimeters lower than the Boxster GTS. 
and the two humps, called streamliners, located behind the roll bars are real eye catchers. Part of the spider's purism is that air conditioning and a radio aren't standard equipment. They're optional extras. Carbon fiber bucket seats are standard and offer plenty of lateral support in all situations. Sasha says driving with the top down lets you enjoy the sound of the 3.8 liter naturally aspirated engine. When you start the car, you can set things so that this button opens the flaps and then the symphony begins. The Boxster Spider weighs in at just 1.3 tons. The lightweight roof with its unheated rear window weighs 11 kilograms less than the motor-driven soft top found in other Porsche Boxsters. The big trunk lid is made of aluminum, saving weight again. The engine generates up to 420 newton meters of torque. That's 50 newton meters more than the Boxster GTS. Standard dynamic transmission mounts give the Spider more stability on curves. Targeted braking of the inside rear wheel enhances steering precision. Driving a Porsche Boxster Spider is a fashion statement in itself, says Sasha, so you needn't worry that the wind has mussed your hair or a cap has flattened it. In the back, the trunk loads 130 liters. That's not a whole lot, but there's also some room up front. Enough for a weekend getaway with your sweetheart. Sasha laments that fuel consumption is so high, 9.9 .9 liters per 100 kilometers, which drives CO2 emissions up to 230 grams per kilometer. Maybe it's better to just look at this car than to drive it. The fourth generation Mazda 2 has been in German car showroom since February. The Super Mini, which is also badged as the Mazda Demio, has shed its conservative image. Its new look is sleeker and sportier. Mazda is targeting its M2 at younger, image-conscious buyers looking to make a self-confident appearance. And here, the Japanese model definitely delivers. Its striking radiator grille and sharp headlights are similar to those used in the Mazda 3 and Mazda 6 and have already received a warm reception. Klaus Brita likes the crisp five-speed transmission and good steering. He says the suspension is a little stiff but makes the Mazda feel safe. And he stresses that the four-cylinder engine runs smoothly. Our test model has a 66 kilowatt gasoline engine with 1.5 liters of cubic capacity and 148 newton meters of torque. At a time when rough and ready three-cylinder engines are all the rage, the Mazda's quiet four-cylinder power plant makes for a pleasant change. Things get a bit noisier at this test site, though. Here, the Mazda reveals some weaknesses. On the obstacle course, it understeers at times and oversteers at others, though the ESP kicks in and stabilizes things. And a braking distance of almost 39 meters for a car going 100 kilometers an hour just isn't acceptable these days. Unlike the car maker's larger models, the Mazda 2 has an analog speedometer. Still, the instruments have a modern look. The interior design boasts unusual elements, like these different air vents. The Japanese model has a style all its own. With its USB ports and Bluetooth, the multimedia system should satisfy the demands of young buyers. It can be controlled centrally using a dial or through the touchscreen. 
The trunk has a maximum cargo capacity of 590 liters, so there's plenty of room for luggage. Unfortunately, the high trunk sill makes it hard to load and unload. When ADAC put the Super Mini to the test, it consumed 4.9 liters of fuel per 100 kilometers. That's fairly thrifty, though not quite as good as the manufacturer's claimed average fuel consumption figures of 4.5 liters. The man from ADAC says the new Mazda 2's fresh design will certainly attract many potential buyers who will then be won over by its inner virtues. Our test car sells for just over 16,000 euros in Germany. Pretty pricey for a super mini, but take the smaller gasoline engine and forego the trimmings and you can pick up a Mazda 2 for less than 13,000. Cars have made life easier for billions of people. But can they do better? Can they take on some routine car-related tasks? In the future, they may be able to find a spot in a parking garage entirely on their own. VW presents V-Charge. It allows the driver to use an app to tell an e-golf to park itself. The user enters the time when they plan to return and, if desired, a request that the car be recharged. The driver receives a confirmation and leaves the car to itself. It does the rest automatically. Car tester Reinhold Deisenhofer believes this is the future of driving. You just leave the car at the garage and go off to an appointment or shopping, and it finds a parking spot automatically. The real sensation is that if a garage has a charging station, the car can automatically go to recharge itself. When it's fully charged, it frees up the station and finds another parking spot. Self-parking cars pose no danger to other drivers or pedestrians. Cameras, ultrasound sensors, and emergency braking systems already developed for conventional models have been adapted for use in the V-Charge project. The car can recognize pedestrians in its path and come to a stop. With V-Charge, an electric car isn't recharged in the usual way. It parks above an induction pad mounted in the floor of the charging bay. The entire charging infrastructure is also far more efficient. Once charging is complete, the car equipped with V-Charge automatically makes way for another car to use the station and finds another parking spot. The navigation system in the garage is self-contained, so a GPS signal is unnecessary for the car to find its own way around. All self-parking cars will eventually have to have access to high-resolution 3D maps of the participating garages to find their way to the charging stations without GPS. VW calls its charging technology eSmart Connect. Reinhold Deisenhofer explains that the charging station of the future will work completely independently of humans. The car drives itself in and a robot arm makes the connection. It takes 19 to 30 minutes to reach 80% of the battery capacity, which the car detects by itself and automatically makes the station available or the robot can move to another car. But why do we need a robot arm at all? The high voltages require thick cables, which are heavy and inflexible. They may be too cumbersome for some people to handle. But the robot arm has no problem with it, and the driver can go shopping or have a cup of tea in the meantime. Once the robot has accessed the car's data, it can locate the connector and plug in the charging cable without human help. A camera and a light help it to target the socket with millimeter precision. But the robot can't open the recharging cap itself. There are too many variations of shape and position for it to remember. Either the driver will have to open the cap before handing over the car, or when the time comes, it will have to open itself electronically.
When Czech car maker Tatra rolled out the T87 in 1936, it was the avant-garde of automotive design. It embodied the new vehicular philosophy of the already well-established company. The steel body was self-supporting and aerodynamic. The engine was air-cooled and rear-mounted. At a time when most cars still looked more like coaches, the T87 triggered an automotive revolution. Tatra collector Ulrich Platzek recalls the first time he ever saw a T87. It was not far from the former Tatra plant. His father was the founder of the German Tatra Club. Every year before the season began, they would drive to the plant in Kopranitsa. They took the opportunity to look over the cars the club there owned. He walked into an old barn, and the first thing he saw was the rear of a T-87. He didn't know what it was, but he said to himself, I've got to have this car. The progressive design was the work of Hans Ledwinka and Erik Uberlacher. Ledwinka was an Austrian engineer and a brilliant designer who had worked for Tatra since 1921. Ledwinka's credo was lightweight construction and aerodynamic design. It broke with all the automotive conventions of the time. Now it looks a bit like something from the 1930s science fiction series. Spats over the rear wheels and the long sloping rear were an early attempt at streamlining. The striking fin down the back helped to stabilize the car at high speeds. Large air intakes kept the wind flowing over the engine and back with the hot air escaping through slits in the rear lid. But it took a bit of practice to get used to handling this rear heavy car, especially on wet pavement or at high speeds. Driving expertise was essential. Ulrich Platzek confirms that the T87 fishtails all too easily and unexpectedly. There's no warning of any kind. The car may be speeding along at a good clip and all of a sudden, off it goes. The cause is the T87's poor weight distribution. The two and a half liter rear mounted engine had a light magnesium alloy block but still, it lay heavy on the rear axle. The V8 overhead cam was common among racing and high-performance cars of the time. Even with an output of just 75 horsepower, the aerodynamic T87 still reached top speeds close to 150 kilometers per hour. In contrast to the body, the interior appeared quite conventional, aside from a few Art Deco touches. Even with such a complete array of instruments, the Tatra was easy to operate. The sight lines were generous through the big windshields, as long as the driver was looking straight ahead. Another feature unusual for the 1930s was the manual sliding roof. The trunk in front carried two spare wheels. Good to have along, given the bad roads of the time. The Tatra T87 was high-end avant-garde. So much so that only 3,000 were ever built. Surviving communism, the Tatra company produced cars until 1998 with rear-mounted V8 engines to the very end. 